Well, thank you for the warm welcome here today. We feel part of God's family being here, so uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm here because my friend Josh has uh, been urging me over many years to come and share with you, and, uh, but don't blame him if you're not happy with what you hear today. I've been following the, uh, the series on Galatians online and uh, really appreciated the insights that the team have provided. And the end of Barry's message last week, we um, saw that the danger of seeking to be justified by the works of the law and uh, that the solution to, or to stop us from doing that uh, required crucifixion with Christ or a vision of being crucified with Christ. And uh, we'll continue on that theme today as we look at um, chapter three. It's like you've stopped thinking. You've become illogical. Someone or something has influenced you, you in such a way, it's like you've come under a spell. You've allowed someone to appeal to your sinful pride. You're no longer able to reason. You're just being stupid. Don't blame me. That's how Paul starts his address, uh, this part of the letter in chapter 3. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? What is wrong with Paul? This man who has such a great, enormous pastoral care, heart, is calling his hearers fools. Well, why is he using such harsh, confronting language? And why is he not calling them brothers like he did at the beginning of this letter? He's just calling them Galatians. He's, he's describing them in terms of their geographical location. Why is Paul so upset? Well, he's extremely concerned about the Galatians. Profoundly concerned. They have a big problem. And he is doing his very best to show them the seriousness of this problem and the solution to it. It was only five verses into this letter that he says, I'm astonished. I'm astonished at you Galatians or you brothers at the time he was calling them brothers. I'm astonished that you have departed from the real gospel and embraced a false gospel. And now he's going to expand on that concern, exactly what it was, that they, the error that they'd fallen into. And it's very important today to realize that this problem is not one that belongs to a Galatian church from 2,000 years ago. It's a problem that can afflict each one of us in our walk with the Lord. We need to be aware of this problem, understand it, and make sure we avoid it. So let's read the rest of verse one. You foolish Galatians who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. I don't know about you, but I would have loved to have to experience the gospel being presented by the apostle Paul. Can you imagine the power with which he represented the cross of Christ as the solution to the need with such power that it was like they were seeing Jesus crucified before their very eyes. I think all preaching should do that. I think all preaching to the lost and to the saved should portray Jesus Christ crucified with such clarity that it's like he's crucified before their very eyes. What would you understand if you saw Jesus Christ crucified before your very eyes? I suggest two things. The seriousness of sin that required such a horrendous penalty. 
And secondly, the magnitude of love that God would send his son to be a substitute. Well, that vision of the cross that, that Paul painted for them certainly got them started. But it did not keep them from this error. He goes on. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or hearing with faith? So Paul acknowledges that they had received the spirit. But the problem wasn't how they started. The problem was how they were continuing. He says, did you receive the spirit because you obeyed the works of the law? Or did you receive the spirit because of that inner hearing, the spiritual hearing you, you received on the basis of receiving faith to embrace God's salvation? On what basis, Galatians, did you receive the spirit? Now, that was a rhetorical question because they knew the answer to that. They knew very well that they had received the spirit on the basis of hear, the hearing of faith. But then he goes on to challenge their assumption that their walk was to continue by works of the flesh. Begin by the spirit, continue by works of the flesh. Let's read verses three to five. He returns to his theme. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the spirit and works miracles among you, do it by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So here we see exactly what their problem was. They're engaging the flesh to do the works of the law to achieve righteousness. How could that possibly work? Paul says, don't be stupid. That couldn't possibly work. Your works of the flesh in response to the law's demands could not possibly perfect what the spirit started. And he even says, was everything you have been through a total waste of time. And this that's where we introduce this, this theme in Galatians where you almost get the sense Paul was saying, you could be lost. This error you've fallen into could result in the loss of your soul. He repeats it several times. I don't believe necessarily that they were going to lose their salvation, but certainly the error was so serious that he wanted to shake them out of their complacency. That there was a lot at stake. So he introduces in verse five, the amazing truth that how you commence your life of faith is meant to continue. You don't start one way and finish another way on a different basis. The Galatians had started right, but they were deceived into thinking there was another way to continue. He says that God working among them was not made possible by them keeping the law. God's work among us is not dependent on us keeping the law. We see something in those verses that is really important to understand. The flesh. I think we can fall into Christianese very easily. We get used to these terms like the flesh. And I don't know about you, perhaps it's just me. But what is the flesh? What exactly is it? How do we get it? Why does it love the works of the law? And if it's a problem, how do we stop it? Perhaps it's just me. Bear with me if you can stand here and explain to me exactly what the flesh is, then I apologize. But I was burdened as I prepared this message to focus on what the flesh is. This is the center of the Galatians problem, and it could be the center of our problem. And I'm going to use some illustrations to try and explain this.
I've got a pointer here, and if it reflects in someone's eyes, someone's eyes, please put your hand up because I don't want to blind anybody. So we see a few things in this illustration. Again, I've produced this to just get my own thinking clear about what's going on. This is how man as God created man to be. The Godhead, Father, Holy Spirit, and Son spoke into created man's life through the Holy Spirit interacting with the human spirit. So uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul talks, um, asks God, or says his prayer for them is that God preserve their spirit, soul, and body. So Paul identifies that there are those components to us as we were created. The important thing is that it was the Holy Spirit was interlocked with our human spirit so that our behavior might be directed by the Holy Spirit. So that was God's order, spirit directing soul, directing body, act, bodily activities. Now, the soul is the seat of intellect, emotions, and will. So all of that was to be directed by the Holy Spirit. And that worked beautifully. God said, that's very good. Now, it's important to, to note that at that stage, the law did exist. The Garden of Eden represented by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, a simple test of obedience. That's all the law was, but it was present. Irrelevant to Adam and Eve until they fell. Satan and the demons were also present, we know. Again, irrelevant until they fell. So God said in Genesis 1.31, that was very good. Next, the fall. So what happened to that perfect human being when, when we fell? Let's click the right button and we'll get there. So Satan laid an ingenious trap. What he said through Eve and to Adam, look, you are spiritually dependent. That's a pain. If you take the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and you understand good and evil, you can make your own judgments on morality. You can make your own decisions instead of being burdened by this control of the Holy Spirit. You can make your own decisions. You can become independent, a real man. Well, they agreed to move out of the constraint of being Holy Spirit directed to being independently directed. I will do things my way. As a result of that, the interlock between the Holy Spirit and the human spirit was broken. No longer was man governed by the Holy Spirit. And his body became a mortal body. We paid a high price for rebelling against God. That's described as spiritual death in Genesis 2.17 and resulted in physical death as described in Genesis 3.19. The interesting thing is that this spiritual death, but still a soul that was alive, so a spiritually dead soul, produced this thing called the flesh. So that flesh became the dominant controlling feature of fallen humanity. Public enemy number one, flesh, introduced as a result of the fall, never part of God's plan, hostile to God and causes us such pain, such distress, such misery. That flesh is the reason the world is in such a mess. Well, when Adam, Adam fell, when 
Man fell, disconnected from the Holy Spirit. The law started to have an influence, like a torch shining on fallen humanity to say, look at the way, look at the error, look at the problems. Here's God's righteous standard. How are you doing with that? And also the demonic forces gained superb access to our humanity through the flesh. The flesh loved, craved governance. And Satan was more than willing to assist with governing our behavior through the flesh. God says in Genesis 6, 6 and 7, the heart of man is only evil continually. It's enough to make you cry. Such a perfect creation became something that generated evil continually. And it says that God was sorry he made man. I just want to spend a bit more time explaining flesh a bit more. This is the error that the Galatians fell into. Serving God with the flesh. Can you imagine how offensive that is to God? Now, there's lots of names given to this flesh in the Bible. Flesh, old man, old nature, sin nature, law of sin and death, evil principle or sin. And unfortunately, in the Greek, the same word for physical flesh is used for this flesh. Totally different thing. So when God sends light into a person's life, they become aware that they fall short of God's standards and the flesh starts trying to keep the law. That's the automatic reaction. The covenant of the law was introduced by God specifically to expose the inadequacy of the flesh. And we'll hear more about that next week. So when you read under the law, it is describing the same thing as in the flesh or of the flesh. Flesh responds to law's demands, trying to prove itself and justify itself. So the characteristics of this flesh, it's resident in our mortal body, be free of it when we don't have a mortal body, when we have an immortal body. This flesh is desperate to justify itself, to vindicate itself. And it desires the law to prove its worth and then hates the law when it exposes its failure. And the flesh does what it's done since Adam fell. When proved wrong, it seeks to justify itself by accusing God, like Adam who said, it's your fault I hid because I was naked. You didn't give me clothes. Or to blame someone else the woman you gave to be with me, she is the problem. Deflecting blame on anyone and anything except accepting that the flesh is a problem. What is God's opinion of this flesh? Fascinating. Top of the screen, a whole bunch of verses. Hard to read, so that's okay, but I just wanted to put them there in case to, to show you that uh, I'd drawn from all of those verses what, how God feels about the flesh. There it is. The flesh provides no benefit. It cannot justify, is condemned by God, excludes from grace, is weak, is only escaped from by a person being born again, works sinful, corrupt passions in us, cannot do good, is hostile toward God, does not subject itself to the law of God and is not able to do so, cannot please God, is incapable of spiritual fight, is against the spirit, its deeds are evil, it wars against the soul, is of the world, not of the Father. Do you understand why Paul was so alarmed that they were using the flesh, that flesh, to try and keep the law to please God?
What happened to the flesh at redemption? What a magnificent redemption. But we need to understand what happened to the flesh despite this magnificent redemption. So the Holy Spirit, the interlock with the human spirit was restored. Fantastic. Once again, directed by the Holy Spirit, governed by the Holy Spirit, animating the soul, directing the mind, the emotions, and the will. Fantastic. But the flesh is still present in the mortal body. So what happens? The Holy Spirit, through our spirit, fighting to direct us, and the old habits, the old pattern of Satan through the flesh trying to govern and direct our behavior. Still there. Still there. The flesh still in our mortal body. As long as we have an immor a mortal body, that's going to be a conflict. However, is it to remain a conflict that we win some and lose some? Is that the Christian life? Sometimes defeated by the flesh, sometimes not. Sometimes the Holy Spirit has supremacy, sometimes the flesh has supremacy. Is that what Jesus died to produce? Well, the law is still present in the redeemed person. However, the law doesn't speak to somebody who's saved unless they fall into error. Then the, the, the law activates to reveal the sin. But without sinning, the law has no place in the in the part in the in the life of the believer because he's spiritually controlled, not law controlled. Not responding to the law's demands, responding to the spirit's demands, obeying the spirit. And obeying the spirit elevates us way above anything that we could be achieve as, as uh, responding to, to the law's demands. The law is established by faith. The demonic forces are present, always trying to take control of us through the flesh. So the flesh is our enemy. The Galatians were redeemed, it seems. Paul says that. You began in the spirit but they were attempting to be acceptable to God through the power of sinful flesh. This is futile and is not acceptable to God. Not when he's provided an acceptable covenant of grace by faith. So why is the attraction of this covenant of works so incredibly strong? Why was it so strong in the Galatians and why can it be so strong in us? It's a system of rules. The law is a system of rules which is so appealing to us. To, to uh, We are drawn to that because we prefer that. Naturally speaking, we prefer that to the covenant of grace. What? Why do we prefer the covenant of works rather than the covenant of grace? Well, the covenant of grace hurts our pride. It's an offense to us, naturally speaking. It establishes the truth that we are bankrupt lawbreakers, leaving us totally vulnerable before God, and we don't like that. We don't want to be exposed to the fact that we are bankrupt spiritually. We are vulnerable because there is absolutely no basis of justification within me. The law proves that. And we become totally dependent on mercy, vulnerable, relying on God's grace. It makes us uncomfortable. But there is victory. There is victory over the flesh. We'll see when we get to chapter 5, verse 16, that Paul exhorts them to walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. We'll leave that to chapter 5. There is victory. He goes on to talk about 
our foundation for faith in Abraham. Just as Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, therefore recognize that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. We need to be very, very clear. Abraham's faith did not make him righteous. God made him righteous by accounting his faith for righteousness. God's accounting is not pretending. Real righteousness is accounted. It's just not ours. It's Jesus Christ's. Well, you might say, that's great for Abraham, but what has that got to do with us all these thousands of years later? Good question, and Paul answers that here. It was back in Genesis 12, 3, that God promised Abraham that all nations of the earth would be blessed through him. That is, the coming Messiah, Jesus, who would be Abraham's descendant, is the promise. The promise was given to Abraham with all nations in mind not just the Jewish nation. Let's read on verses 10 to 12. For all who are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to do them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous one will live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, the person who performs them will live by them. All that the law requires or prohibits must be fulfilled at all times, in every way, no matter what the circumstances or a curse is proclaimed. There's an alternative to that covenant. Alternatively, you can surrender to God to be justified by faith. Are we saying there's no good works for a Christian? Absolutely not. It is not the action that's the problem. It's the source of it and the motivation for it. So which covenant do you want to be judged under? Works or grace? In verses 13 and 14, we read, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham would come upon, come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the spirit through faith. The curse has been removed from us if we believe in Jesus who has been made a curse for us. What a price was paid. You know, the Jews bury their dead very quickly. It's, it's a Jewish cultural thing that a dead person, it's a shame for a, a body of a dead person to be out on, on display, exposed for very long. They buried them very quickly. Jesus was left hanging on a cross, fully exposed. But you know, it's not his physical suffering that really the curse was his father turning his back on him. He bore the curse so that we could be delivered from the curse. He goes on to talk about 
how the covenant of grace is not annulled by the covenant of works given 430 years later. So he describes how covenants work, and we won't read those verses. It's like this. I sold a car recently. The guy came with the money. He gave me the money. He took the car. I couldn't keep the car and keep the money. And he couldn't keep the money and take the car. And he couldn't come back two weeks later and say, I've got a new deal that I want you to come into, and that is that the car needs repainting. No, that wasn't the deal. I would say, thanks, but I'll stick to the first deal. Not the second deal where I have to repaint the car. The covenant of promise God made with Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, and fulfilled by Jesus thousands of years later, cannot be cancelled or modified by a covenant made 430 years later. So why was the covenant of the law added at all? We'll come next week to hear the answer to that. Let's wrap up. I don't know everybody here, but if you are here today and you haven't given your life to the Lord, if you're unsaved, then you are in big trouble. I have to tell you that if you have ever broken any of God's commandments at any time, even if you're unaware of it, you'll be judged and found guilty as a lawbreaker. This makes you liable for the curse we spoke about. You can change all that today. There are plenty of people here today who you can speak to to avoid that tragic consequence. But maybe you're here today and God has been speaking to you that your Christian life has become works-focused and that you have an eye to what the law requires instead of an eye to the Spirit and obeying the Spirit only. Romans 8.13, I'm finishing with this says this, for if you are living in accord with the flesh, you are going to die. But if by the spirit, you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Are you prepared for God to show you right now whether you are living in the flesh or in obedience to the spirit? Are you prepared from now on to allow God by his spirit to put to death the deeds of the flesh in you? That's the path to the glorious liberty of the children of God.